Ladies and gentlemen, once again, we are back. We haven't been canceled yet, even though this is all self-funded and self-financed, and I hope we wouldn't cancel ourselves. This week is a lot calmer than last week. But, you know, me personally, I feel like I'm still banging my head against the wall. We're going to talk about how we feel the main event feuds are going. We're going to talk about how we feel things are going up the hill in the cell. And then we're going to talk about, you know, in my little note at the end, I'm just going to talk about the business that WWE is doing right now. And, you know, if you if you felt a trend with our discussions about NXT versus the main roster, if you feel the same way that we do about NXT versus the main roster, I think that when you get to the end of this podcast, you'll 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 hear a lot of things that you might agree with. If you don't get at me, but I mean, you know, you, you might you might come to the sobering realization that I have. So, without further ado, I don't want to waste your time. I enjoy that you spend it with us very much. Here is this week's edition of the Playmakers Block Podcast Wrestling Edition. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, fans of all ages and creeds and patience levels, we are back with another week of the Playmakers Blog Podcast Wrestling Edition. I'm your frustrated and confused wrestling host, Dallas Glenn, and to the other side of my is the great Darnell Playmaker Solens. How are you feeling today, Darnell? I'm doing good. Got some you know, to talk about. Yeah, you know, so we're going to – it's not going to be like last week because unlike last week, we're, we're not angry and flustered. We're literally – well, we're not to the end, but we're getting close. So, Darnell, to start off, let's, let's talk about the TV. We're going to talk about the TV that I'm going to try to sit down and just, just try to analyze from my end why I think this stuff is going on. So let's talk about the TV. Let's start with Raw. How would you like it? Raw was, to, to, to be the type of week that it is, it, it was all right. It was, it, was, it was normal, you know. And then you got your shocking ending. So, you know, it's a pretty quick, it was typical normal Raw when there's nothing big going on. Mm. That's that's kind of the reason why I'm so I'm kind of almost at the end of the rope because it's like you know uh, normal really means terrible. Like, do we mean normal as in like this is what we should expect from the flagship show, or does normal mean like you know this is this is the quality that we've been adjusted to? Like, I, I've I've said it once and I've said it before. It's either WWE is inconsistent or they're just too smart for their own good. Raw, it... The first thing with Raw is, and this kind of ties into what we'll be talking about later, the three hours is is killing the show because they put the same... Basically the same 12 people on every week. It's Finn Balor, Bear Corbin every week. It's Bailey and Sasha Banks every week. It's Roman and Seth every week. It's Dolph, Dolph and Jinder every week. Kevin Owens just quit, but Kevin Owens used to be on every week. Like, it's the same. It, 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 it baffles me that they're signing so many people and that the roster is as bloated as it is. And you can still tell there's people in the back that barely ever get TV time. Dana Brooke just had her first match in months. And by months, I mean by What? Thank you, Titus. That was very smart of Titus O'Neil to do. Yeah, I mean, somebody's got to help her. I mean, geez. This woman didn't have a match in nine months, and who you put her against? The boss. Out of all the women you could have chose, you just had to pick Sasha Banks. It's one of those things where it's like, okay, we have one lady who hasn't wrestled in nine months. Okay, we're finally giving somebody in ring time. Uh, how about Fox? Fox is back for the first time in forever. Could have did Fox, even though she went against Natalia. You could have did Ember Moon. She's still young. I mean, you could have did 
somebody from the White Riot Squad having a singles match and getting used to being in front of a crowd of that magnitude in singles, because if they're really about to go against the Bella Twins, then either Sarah Logan or Liv Mark Morgan needs to know how to go. I mean, you know that, you know, Ruby Riot is going to be in that match. She's the leader of the squad. It's just, you know, it's the principle, Darnell. It's like, you know, when you put Dana Brooke against Sasha Banks, it's it's wrestling. We get the deal. We get the deal. It's just WWE is this close from being like Lucha Underground. What do you mean by that, Dallas? I mean, WWE is this close from being a professional wrestling promotion that puts on TV shows to being a TV show about pro wrestling. They're this close. So when you think about Raw and SmackDown being TV shows about pro wrestling, Sasha Banks is one of the main characters. Why would a main character lose to somebody who hasn't wrestled in months? It's one of those things where it's like, geez, I mean, did Sasha really need to beat Dana Brooke? Then what makes it even worse is you realize that Dana Brooke hasn't been in a match in forever, so you try to let her get something. So you try to let her get her stuff in and get some roll-ups and some quick pin attempts, but, like, you know, she still has to tap. It's it's odd to me, man. Like, you know, <clears throat> you go back to the uh, Finn Balor, Baron Corbin thing. Darnell, I'm, I'm worried because there's a trend going on where it's like, you know, you win at the pay-per-view, but the TV show, either the next week or the week after next, basically negates what happened at the pay-per-view. Why is Baron Corbin still going against Finn Balor? See, I think on that one, you know, Baron Corbin is now the acting general manager overall now. So you know how heel authority figures are. If there's some unfinished business in their mind, they have to go back and take care of that. So I think that's what they did with Baron Corbin. Okay, so my first act has to be I have to, get, I have to pay Finn Balor back for what he did to me at SummerSlam because I'm in charge now. Okay. And that's reasonable. It's just, that's not the only thing. Like, it's it's weird how they're doing it. We're going towards Hell in a Cell, which has the pay-per-view match in two weeks. Like, you guys just had match after match after match after match after match, and it culminated at SummerSlam. You got Hell in a Cell in two weeks. Baron, what are you doing? Creative, what are you doing? Like, Finn should be built. Finn just had a Universal Championship match the night after he beat Baron Corbin. And Baron Corbin wasn't the one that came down to distract somebody in the match. It was Braun. Like, Finn's supposed to be moving on. Baron's supposed to be moving on. Like, you're, you're in this position of power now. Like, you, you, you can call the shots and run things, but you're putting yourself in a match while still wearing your business clothes against somebody who just had a Universal Championship match last week and squashed you at SummerSlam. It's, it's it's ruining the significance of the victories at the pay-per-views. Then, like, you know, you keep going. A, a, a thing that I really get is the, the shocking ending. I get it in general. Like, I agree in general. Like, you know, because that's basically what Raw does. They either shock you in the middle and have you talking about something in the middle, or they try to save it to make people stay for that third hour for the ad money. The ending was a shock ending. It's just odd to me because it's like in the beginning of the show, you have him do the John Cena, tell you exactly when, tell you exactly where, cash in. Then he turns heel at the end of the show. If you're going to turn Braun Strowman heel, have him be tired of trying to do things the right way. Have him be tired and done with it and then get his stuff in, get Roman back the next week. And keep the briefcase. I mean, technically, he hasn't cashed in the briefcase, and Baron Corbin is quote unquote keeping it for him. Since Kevin Owens has quit, Kevin Owens won't steal the briefcase. I saw some people thinking about that. So Kevin Owens isn't going to steal the briefcase. He quit. Baron Corbin being the GM, the way that they're doing things with Finn Balor and everything, it's it's weird. Like on one hand, the match for Hell in a Cell is official. Like it's already written in the books. It's written in the books as a cash in. But because technically Baron Corbin's the GM and the GM in storyline signed on the match officially already, they could technically have a contract signing like next week or something and Baron could just steal the briefcase because the match is going to happen regardless. 
that's both a good and bad hole to the storyline. I just, I don't understand it. Like you, you recognize almost immediately the fan reaction from after you turned Becky Lynch heel. Like you, you, you do all those posts and you do all those polls and things. Like eh, we're not oblivious. Oh, we'll get to Becky Lynch. Yeah, we're we're gonna get to that. But but my point is that the Becky Lynch thing. Then you turn around and turn Braun Strowman heel. It's like, dude, we, we, you, you just went through this. Like you you just went through this. Now you've got somebody who won Money in the Bank. I, I, I said this from way before. I said this way before. If a raw person wins money in the bank, it's going to be another waste of the briefcase and it's going to be too confusing to book because everybody knows how they want the Universal Championship to play out. Now, Roman's not going to just get the championship, have somebody cash in three weeks ahead of time so that he can prepare for three whole weeks and lose the belt. It, it's not going to happen. Because what WWE is doing is basically, well, you know, if it's Charlotte, if it's Roman, if it's John, like, you know, if it's AJ, you know, the baby faces now, the, the baby faces can do what they need to do to get the job done. Uh, uh, the baby face can lose their temper. Uh, uh, the baby face can call in for reinforcements. Um, the, 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 the baby face can get intentionally DQ'd. Uh, the baby face can do what they have to do. What? That that's not the WWE style of doing things. That's not how you do things. You you can't just switch it up whenever you feel like. But then when it comes to a situation like Roman, this is what you want. This is what you're gonna stick with. I mean, I mean, long 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 story short, Darnell, it's Raw is still too long. I think this is one of those shows that perfectly exhibited like you know, there's a lot better time to do with your three hours on a Monday night. But it's a Monday night. It's the, it's the time slot. When Monday Night Football starts again, that's when the ratings are going to start dipping. But when you think about it, I mean, you know, a Monday Night Basketball game in the NBA season, if there is a Monday Night Basketball game, it's literally probably just two bottom feeder teams playing on local TV. There's very rarely a major game on Monday night for basketball. Uh, same thing with hockey. I mean, we're American. Hockey is still probably number four out of the four major sports. And then baseball is baseball. But, you know, once the NFL starts, I'm not saying that's going to change their booking. I'm just saying that, you know, the Monday, Tuesday time slot is the beginning of the work week. You know people are going to be home. People aren't going to go out on a Monday or Tuesday night because they know they got work the next morning. But, I mean. This old Braun Strowman heel turn, my my question is, how do you turn him heel, though? Because we talked about it a lot. I'm like, he's a monster. So, basically, he, he can just turn heel whenever. You know, so what he when how he turned heel, it it kind of works for me. It's like Roman tagged him in. He looked at Roman. He looked at Dolph Ziggler and Drew McIntyre, and he was like, "Y'all can y'all can go ahead and do what y'all got to do." I mean, he's a monster, so it's like how how do you prepare for a monster when it comes to a hell in the cell, man? So Bar Trump is like one of those once in a lifetime type of people or wrestlers characters. That you just can't normally do it. Normally book them. Right now, this is basically John Cena booking one on one, like one on one. Like this is John Cena booking one on one. When John Cena was at the peak of his run as the top guy, this was literally it. They would have somebody where it was like, "Yo, like this guy's legit. This guy is like unbeatable. Like how is he gonna beat him? Like this isn't just any regular match." And they would have the build up. Now Braun Strowman isn't alone, and he's not getting two rookies like Authors of Pain. He has main event caliber guys and Ziggler and McIntyre. He has guys who've been around the block. Uh, Drew has been going one on one with Dolph, and then uh, no, I mean uh, Dolph has been going one on one with Seth, and Drew and Dean have some issues. So you know you've got the cancel out effects and everything, the good old wrestling cancel out effects, the mathematics of it. So it's like, you know, everything's an equal playing field now. Three babies, three heels. But it's, the problem is, Darnell, it's equal. Hell in a Cell, when chaos ensues, two are going to come out for Braun, two are going to come out for Roman. Throughout all the chaos, Roman's going to find a way to hit a spear out of nowhere and get the one, two, three, after he probably takes like five power slams. Like this is literally the type of booking 
that drove away so many people in John Cena's era. Like it's one of those things where it's like, holy crap, I they're really about to do this again. In the John Cena era, you had people like Randy Orton, Edge, um Oh, prepare for that one because Dallas got a lot to say about this Randy Orton Jeff Hardy situation. Oh, well, I'm trying to think of in the PG era was yeah, Randy Orton Edge, CM Punk, Jeff Hardy, whenever he was there. You basically had like, you know, around the same amount of guys who, okay, we get that John's the top guy, but you got a lot of guys who can hold a main event championship and John can like, you know, work with somebody else. It doesn't have to be all about John. But from WrestleMania 22 to like WrestleMania 29, 29, it was John, 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 John. And what John would say in promos and in real life is, you know, nobody else would step up. But I find it kind of hard to believe that like nobody else would step up when everybody in the back knows I'm only holding this just to drop for John. You don't become a 16-time world champion between a yeah, – okay, everybody think about this real quick. Think about this real quick because this is all on the same line. Just keep following me. It's all on the same line. Ric Flair is a 16-time world heavyweight champion. If I think Ric Flair's last world championship was either in 1993 or 1995. Might have even been like 97 or something because of WCW. My point is this. His last world championship was sometime in the 90s. Ric Flair's career started in like the 70s. Ric Flair was in the National Wrestling Alliance. Like, he wasn't in one promotion his entire career and packed in 16 world championships in the span of 12 years. John Cena has been in one promotion. When he was in that one promotion, he debuted in 2002. He won his first World Heavyweight Championship in 2005. I think, did he beat AJ Styles last year in the Royal Rumble to win the championship? Was that 2017? Yeah. Okay, so from 2005. They got him at SummerSlam. John Cena got him back at Royal Rumble. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. So from April 2005 to January 2017, not even a full 12 years, John Cena won 16 World Heavyweight Championships while being in one single promotion. Dallas, we're talking about Roman. Why does that matter? We just got done with an era where the fans basically told you. The fans left. Wrestling-wise, people did not dig that run. You you have to spread yourself out. You, you, you can't be on one promotion basically doing everything on one show because once he went to Raw, he never looked back. And I think if I remember correctly, he went to Raw during his first championship reign. Yeah, he went to Raw during his first championship reign. Got the title, got drafted to Raw. Yeah, so think about it, Darnell. All 16 World Heavyweight Championships, except for the one in 2017 when he was technically a free agent, happened on Raw. John Cena, uh, the super shows don't count. Back when the brand brand extension kind of like dissolved, that doesn't count because John Cena's still John. yeah, Yeah, one show. 16 world championship. It it got old really quick. Then you unified the world heavyweight championships. So you basically said it was going to be John Cena, Brock, Roman, Randy. The thing that's happening now is like, you know, if if this plays through, like everybody is scared it's going to play through, Darnell. What you're basically going to have is you made us wait for Roman to finally get crowned. You have Roman beat somebody who never got his universal championship rematch. The next night. Now you're going to have somebody cash in three weeks ahead of time, but turn heel at the end of the same show where Roman already knows when he's going to cash in. This this is literally them going down the exact same route. Now, is this to say that Shawn Michaels and Hulk Hogan didn't have their booking issues? They did. Shawn didn't want to lose to anybody. Hulk Hogan didn't want to lose to anybody. The wrestlers tried to start a union and Hulk Hogan snitched. So top guys in WWE, this this is this has always been an issue. 
That's why the attitude error will forever be viewed as the best error by a lot of people. <clears throat> and the ruthless aggression error is probably going to come second because the ruthless aggression error had Kurt Angle, Big Show, Brock Lesnar, Triple H, Shawn Michaels, and John Cena coming up the rank. The attitude error had Stone Cold Steve Austin, The Rock, Triple H, Chris Jericho, and then all the other mid card feuds that were like classics in the tag team division having TLC and stuff. The point of the matter is the two best eras, if you ask a lot of people, it wasn't just because it was TV 14. It wasn't just because there was action and blood. It was because there wasn't one guy basically getting shoved down the viewer's throat. If you think of WWE as a TV show about wrestling, you can get why you don't want to watch the same TV show over and over if you know how the end is going to be over and over. It's usually why a lot of people over 25 still don't watch Power Rangers. You kind of get how Power Rangers is going to go every episode if you watched it for a couple seasons. That's kind of sort of how it's getting for me, at least on Raw. Now, SmackDown, NXT 205 Live, I I have like things I could talk about, but I have no true complaint. Because what's weird to me, Darnell, as we transition is SmackDown kind of sort of gets it. SmackDown, AJ Styles, even though he's defended the championship a lot of times against the same people, he's kind of been walking out the back door. Like, transitioning to SmackDown, let's, let's talk about their Hell in a Cell match that we know of so far. Because I think it confused me and you both. Like, I think, I think you get how it can be in Hell in a Cell, but you're still like kind of like me, where it's like, why is that match in Hell in a Cell? Yeah, you're right. I, I, I get it. I know why they're doing it. But you sure you didn't want to put the WWE Championship inside Hell in a Cell? Or how this story is unfolding? Because Samoa Joe is continuing to steep to low levels to AJ Styles. Like a Hell in a Cell match will fit perfectly in his rivalry. But they want to put Jeff Hardy and Randy Orton in Hell in a Cell. And I get it. Pretty much the the charismatic enigma, the high flyer, the Jeff Hardy that we grew up watching, seems like it's supposed to die inside Hell in a Cell. A match of that magnitude, it's like it's when a career changes or a character is gone and a new one comes in. So I'm guessing that's what they're going to put. Yeah. I mean, now that Matt is almost officially done with their ring competition, maybe this is the end of Jeff Hardy's baby face character. Maybe now we'll actually see Brother Nero, and maybe that's how the feud between Jeff Hardy and Randy Orton will actually start to kick up into another gear. Because Hell in a Cell, and that's the thing, like, you know, Hell in a Cell used to be the end of a feud. Now it seems like they're just using it as another vehicle. Like, AJ Styles, time and time and time and time again, won matches or defended his title by either a draw or a loophole. Now he defended his title by getting intentionally DQ'd because Samoa Joe told Wendy that he would be his daddy now. Why, when you have a champion that keeps getting DQ'd, and keeps escaping from matches, why won't you put him in a match stipulation where there's finally no DQ, there's no double count out, there's, there's no none of that. Like, there has to be a winner. You're, you're about to have another WWE Championship match, and there, there has to be a winner. AJ Styles being a babyface and keeping his title by DQs and double count outs, that's getting really old really fast. I don't see why a non-championship feud that really is kind of, you know, the Randy Orton, Jeff Hardy thing, to be honest, is really just getting started. Like, you know, they haven't really, they had one match, and I think that match with Jeff Hardy stomping Randy in the nuts and just walking out, really. Uh, they, they, they haven't really, you know, the, the, the feud started while Jeff was trying to go out, back for his United States Championship. That was the first thing. This is really the first time that they have to be truly one-on-one with each other, and they're basically starting out in Hell in a Cell. I mean, hell, you could put Charlotte Becky in Hell in a Cell, and it'll make more sense than putting that feud in Hell in a Cell. It's See, just they're, not gonna, they're not going to do that. They're saving that for evolution. 
Yeah. And yeah, it, it's they and it's hell in the cell, but that's that that's not the end of it. That's just the beginning. Yeah. But what I'm saying is like, you know, Charlotte Becky, that relationship, it's not like the Miz Daniel Bryan, but that relationship does go back. They could spit some hellfire and some venom over the next two weeks. And they could sell that match being war as hell in the cell. But Randy Orton just being Randy Orton, I mean, come on, man. Jeff Hardy is still the charismatic enigma. That's not a hell in the cell personality. Unless unless Willow or Brother Nero comes out. I'm saying Jeff Hardy is going to jump off the top of that damn cell. Well, yeah, I mean, that's his gimmick. He, he jumps off of stuff. I mean, you know, that's it's, it's something high. He's going to swan on, hopefully, because he is over 40. Randy Orton doesn't move and just takes the bump. No, Randy Orton moves this. I'm saying, I'm, I'm looking way ahead, but I'm saying Jeff Hardy tries it, misses, and that ends Jeff Hardy. Yeah, I mean, like I said, we're back on. Jeff and the thing, the thing that you be saying, like, AJ es- escape is not, I don't call it escape. I'm calling it, think about it. If a man is talking about your family, it's a break in the middle of a match, and spell something to your wife and daughter, the way some more Joe did, you would hit him with a steel chair, too. You won't care about the damn rules at that damn point. Like, hold on. You crossed the line. I don't, You must pay. Darnell, that's all well and good if the last few didn't happen. Like, I get it, but this is pro wrestling. Like, AJ Styles just defended the championship six times. Five of those times, there was some kind of loophole. A DQ here, a DQ there. Double count out in a last man standing match because they both got kicked in the nuts. I mean, Darnell, he's a baby face champion. You can't have him defend the championship by DQ five out of six of the last times then get intentionally DQ'd as a baby face and expect that reason that you just gave to still fly with. I mean, for, for somebody who's casual, for somebody who may not, you know have read a dirt sheet every once in a while, I get it. But, like, you know, it's... Kayfabe's been dead since Triple H said it in 2016 or 15. So when you you know at least a little bit, you kind of get the patterns and stuff. It's AJ being the babyface in WWE booking and traditional wrestling booking. The babyface just isn't supposed to do that. Okay, I'm going to put it like this. If you look at the Nakamura AJ Styles storyline, it was pretty much Nakamura playing games with AJ Styles. AJ said, "You know what? I can play along with this with Samoa Joe. There's no playing games. This is personal." Uh, uh, Darnell, you're, you're you're not connecting with me. You're, you're missing the the center point. I'm not talking about the angle because WWE is sports entertainment style. They care about storylines. I'm not talking about that. The storyline makes sense. I'm saying the execution as far as the ring goes. Like, it, it, first off, I was thinking to myself it was going to be a count out because Joe doing the segment with Wendy and then AJ doing the initial spear through the barricade, I'm thinking to myself, well, geez, it's about to be another double count out. I actually, to be honest, I would still be like, oh, man, that's kind of weak. You know, AJ hasn't, he hasn't, like, actually defended a championship except for, like, one of the last seven times. But, dude, like, that would have been okay. I could get over that. People could get over that. It's the fact that they were outside for, like, 20 seconds. Then he hit him with the chair. It's, it's the execution, man. It's like they can get counted, counted out, then keep brawling. For you to have the match end when AJ Styles was basically about to get beat, and that's how you protect him to keep the thing going, when in actuality Joe's point is you being WWE champion is causing you to be a terrible family man, and what you're getting from your wife isn't what I'm getting from your wife, so let me save you from yourself and take that from you. I mean, maybe maybe after Hell in a Cell, Joe wins, and that's where the feud goes. Maybe it's AJ trying to get the championship and Joe basically exposing AJ like, hey, you know, are you sure you're a family man because you're chasing this an awful lot lately? Maybe that's how it'll go. It's just, you know, it's, 
I just don't like the baby face actively getting DQ'd. I'm not saying that the angle makes the way you're explaining it. I get that. I'm not disagreeing with that. What I'm saying is the in ring execution. It, it's off. It's off. You you can't because what, basically what you have is your baby face champion has actively defended the championship once out of the last seven times. Your baby face has only defended once out of the last seven times. Everything else was a technicality. Baby faces aren't supposed to use champions advantage. And if they are, not six out of the last seven times. That's um that's Triple H in 2003 stuff. I, I hear that, but how else can I match in? If we this it is supposed to be that long. I just said it. I just said it. They were outside for like 15 seconds before AJ even did the spear through the barricade. They could have gotten double counted out. The ref could have thrown the match out. Then AJ could have started brawling with Joe and him with the chair and stuff. They See, but like that wouldn't have worked because pretty much the match is over with. So what did Joe – so why would Samoa Joe say what he said to Wendy, though? No, listen, match, listen, right listen, 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 listen. Samoa Joe and AJ were already outside for like a count of three or four. Then he got up on the table and started talking to Wendy. By the time he talked to Wendy – in kayfabe, the count was like at six or seven. AJ gets up, runs up on the table, spears Joe through the barricade. By then, in kayfabe, the match is about to be a count out because they're laying there and they're selling the spear through the barricade and the ref runs out to check on people. In kayfabe, that was a like kind of 11 or 12. It should have been a double count out. The match should have been thrown out. And then AJ could have still kept going because Joe said what he said. It doesn't make it any more significant that AJ ended the match by DQ. AJ still lost his cool. AJ still didn't get back in the ring to break the count. AJ still lost track of the true goal, which was being a fighting and defending champion. And then what makes it even worse is AJ, after the match is already over and he already defended, he's still beating Joe. Now he's beating Joe when it doesn't mean anything. Now he's beating Joe when the situation has passed. Now he's beating a man in front of his wife and his baby girl, and it has no ramification because the match is over and done with. That's AJ Styles snapping. Not hitting him with a chair a couple of times and ending the match, then going and walking out with his wife. I mean, now what happened is Samoa Joe beat you. Now you have a baby. Okay, now what, what happens is you have a baby face that hit the heel with a chair because he lost his cool. And now Samoa Joe has a legitimate victory over AJ Styles. Whereas before it could have been, they both lost. And AJ still loses his cool. And then the feud still goes how it goes. Like, it, it's the same thing we said with the New Day before the Bludgeon Brothers got hurt. It's like me and you basically said the New Day would have to do some kind of trickery or chicanery because the New Day are the New Day and the Bludgeon Brothers are the Bludgeon Brothers. We, me and you were basically both proven right because even though Eric Rowan got shoot hurt, they had a no DQ match because they understood that the New Day was going to beat them straight up. They had to have some kind of help. It had to be okay for the babyface to do heel things. It's, it's, it's the same thing. It's AJ Styles. It, I don't know, man. Like Maybe, maybe they think that the end ring worked. They don't need a cage gimmick. Maybe they think that, you know, they can make do with what they have and they can just tell the story in the ring. But it's it's just a lot of copping out, man. I don't like how, you know, the Universal Championship match is going to be the main event. And they're basically just... It has to be. It's the Universal Championship and it's inside what the pay-per-view is. Yeah. So the Universal Championship is going to go on last again. And you're telling this story with AJ Styles and Samoa Joe, but now you're telling me that a match that's not even for a championship is going to be in Hell in a Cell? You know, last year, the Tag Team Championship match in Hell in a Cell opened the show. But the way that you booked SummerSlam, the way you booked Extreme Rules, you're probably going to have Hardy and Jeff main event for SmackDown. I mean, uh, Orton and Jeff. No, main event. I think I think dope. I think that Hell in a Cell match will be in the first half of the card. So they're not going. They're not. They're not going to have back to back Hell in a Cell match. I, I want I'm, you to be right. I, I want you to be right. So here's the thing. 
here's the thing. It doesn't have to be back to back because Ronda Rousey is probably going to go on in the semi main again. They do it. It's like with the Elimination Chamber. They never done an Elimination Chamber back to back. I know. What I'm saying is, you still have the women's championship matches. Like the push that they're doing with the women's division, it's it's feasible for Ronda Rousey, Alexa Bliss to semi main so that people can breathe and that they don't have hell in a cell back to back. I mean, dude, WrestleMania in Orlando, Women's Championship semi-main. Uh, Ronda Rousey's debut, I think that was the semi-main. At this year's WrestleMania. SummerSlam, Ronda Rousey winning semi-main. My, question, in the bank. Is, my question is, which one do you choose? Ronda Rousey, Alyssa Bliss rematch, or the best friends finally getting to go at it? It's going to be Ronda Rousey. It's going to be Ronda Rousey. I mean, we can talk about it and break it down, but think about it, man. Like, it's just think about Vince being the chairman of a publicly traded company. It's going to be Ronda. They're not going to go. I don't because I don't, I don't think necessarily because I think they can use they can use Ronda as the main event of Evolution and allow Charlotte and Becky to to, to spotlight Hell in a Cell. No, because all hands on deck are going to be for Evolution. So it's like the championship matches. Okay, no in WWE. They'll probably try to come out hot, quote unquote, and have the NXT Women's Championship open the show. Then they'll have all the little rivalry matches and they have the little Legends Comeback matches. And they'll probably have SmackDown and Raw Women's Championships semi main and main. That's probably how they're going to do Evolution. So when you think about it, you can't really use that because Evolution is literally all about the women's division. They're going to SmackDown and Raw Women's Championship, unless WWE truly messes up they can't mess that up it's impossible to mess that up because it's, it's so obvious nxt opens you have your matches in the middle you semi main in the main with the smackdown of raw women's championships it's about them whereas hell in a cell you have to fit them in with the other matches on the card evolution is all about them to not have those two championships main event what the hell are you doing so i think that because it's a co-ed pay-per-view they still have Ronda semi-main, though. What's bothering me, though, is, like, you know, we're two weeks away, and Samoa Joe and AJ Styles don't have a stipulation. You want to announce on the app and everything that they're going to have a match at the summer show, the Super Showdown. It's a glorified house show. Who cares? Hell in a Cell is about to come up, and what's in a name? Like, no, they, they no, I'm trying to think. It's supposed to be a house show, but I don't think they treat it as a house show. They're, they're, the Greatest Royal Rumble was a house show. They just aired it on the Royal Rumble. They just aired it on the network. This is just a glorified house show. It's not a pay per view. No, what not- I'm saying is they're not treating it like a house show. That's what I'm saying. No, they're not treating it like a house show. Like a house show. They're promoting it and everything because it's how they're going to get into the Australian market. Just like how they wanted to get into the Saudi Arabian market. Just like how they wanted to get into the Indian market. Darnell, they're not treating it like a house show because they want those markets to embrace WWE. And they want those markets to think that WWE like cares that much. They're house shows though. Raw and Raw isn't gonna be regularly held in Saudi Arabia. SmackDown ain't gonna be held in Australia. They're not gonna have TV there all the time. They're trying to do these major events so that when they go there, it's kind of like when they go to small towns in the United States. When WWE comes to Pensacola, ain't no TV camera, ain't no big set, and they come here once a year. For a house show. When they go to Australia and Saudi Arabia, they go once a year for a house show. We're just seeing how much they promote because they're planning to air it on the WWE Network. They promote house shows all the time. They put up posters for house shows all the time. They have radio commercials and TV commercials for house shows all the time. The only difference is this is how they're actually infiltrating these markets for the first time for whatever reason. So they're hyping it up more than usual. This is how much they hype up the Madison Square Garden show. House show. Madison Square Garden show. The Madison Square Garden show ain't even televised. They don't even put that on the network. But now they're mad that Ring of Honor and New Japan want to go into the Madison Square Garden. When Dude, they, all, when they did show. air that on the network, there wasn't no bit behind Magic like they got coming to Australia. What, Madison Square Garden or Greatest World Rumble? This is my Madison Square Garden. Darn it. For for you to bring the Undertaker, Undertaker was at Madison Square Garden this year to go against Triple H. He was at Madison Square Garden this year. 
knowing how people feel about that rivalry. Which has been over for a decade. That's you. I mean, I appreciate you for trying, Darnell. I do. You're you're definitely you're you're definitely giving it the company go. They need to. They re- I'm serious. I'm not trying. They need to like find you and pay you because you. They need you on a marketing team because I'm I'm sitting here. And I'm just like it's a house show. It's a house show. I ain't say I ain't say it wasn't a house. I said how they treating it. No, and like and me and you don't disagree on that. I'm just saying it's like it doesn't matter how you try to sell it to me. It doesn't matter how you try to promote it to me. I literally see how you were going tit for tat with Ring of Honor and New Japan over Madison Square Garden, and you don't even televise that show on the network, and you do it every year. You try to make it seem like this big thing. So, like, how am I supposed to – it's a house show, and they're trying to get into a new market. That's that's basically the crux of it. That's, that's, that's the crux of it. That's the central line thing of it. That's why it seems so big. But what's irking me is, like, why are you announcing matches for that right now? You have a pay-per-view coming up in two weeks. You're saying AJ Styles versus Samoa Joe, but it's like, okay, but they have to have another match, guys. Don't you want to, like, you know, wait till you release those graphics? Don't you want to wait until you make that announcement? Don't you want to, you know, for, for let those, stuff play for, out? For those who not understand what he is saying, he's basically saying, by them already telling us that AJ Styles and Samoa Joe is going to go into October, basically, whatever happens at Hell in the Cell, it's not the end. So anything can happen at Hell in a Cell. It's just not the end of it. It's going to continue. Dallas, Darnell, you guys said last episode that you guys already think this feud has legs. So what are you mad about? Dude, we already get that it's not a shoot competition. We already get that the guys that get the reaction, the guys that Vince likes backstage – are going to get the pushes. and the, We already know how everything goes. Can you just let us have something? Can you let us have something? We don't want to know everything. Me and Darnell aren't scouring dirt sheets every day, every hour. We ain't trying to know everything. We're just like everybody else. We want to be entertained and excited. We want to be shocked and surprised. It's just like, Jesus, man. Like, uh, I don't know. But it... So, along with that... The Cruiserweight Championship's going to get a push real quick. Uh, Cruiserweight Championship's getting a push. Yeah, I think Seth Alexander, I think it said Seth Alexander will be facing Murphy. Okay, Buddy Murphy. Birdie Murphy yeah. at Super Showdown. At the show. That's that's good. I mean, you know, I think me and you said it last week, you know, 205 Live needs something. Me and you both don't know what it is, but that's a great start. That that championship needs to be on a big event like that. It's a house show, but, I mean, they're they're, they're pushing it. It's going to be on the network. The Cruiserweight Championship needs to be there. NXT, I think it's really interesting. WWE keeping the tradition of baby faces confusing the hell out of everybody. Ricochet and Pete Dunne are bickering back and forth with each other. And Undisputed Era just seems like they're a well oiled machine. How, how, how is this going to go? Because it, it's, the, it's the traditional... The, the, the guy outside pulling his, his teammates to safety and the two partners... Collide, collide with each other. And the opposite team gets the win. But Ricochet and Pete Dunne don't like Undisputed Era. Mm-hmm. Where do they go from here? I mean, Pete Dunne, even though he's a part of British Strong Style, the last time he had a tag team partner, and he was trying to take on Undisputed Era, that tag team partner joined Undisputed Era. So it's understandable why Ricochet might not trust somebody going against Undisputed Era. Completely fair. And it was Keith Strong who actually pulled his pulled his two teammates to safety when Ricochet was going for that suicide dive. Yep. I mean, you know, numbers game, man. Freebird rule. It's a, it's a great thing. Um, I'm happy that, you know, it's like I said, the, the, the dynamic with Adam Cole is so interesting because he's still a champion right now. But you can tell that they're keeping everybody involved so that when the time comes, Adam can still be in Ricochet's head. You know, that was that was pretty much like the spotlight view of the show. Keith Lee had another amazing exhibition. I, I just hope that, you know, as he gets used to the WWE system and the style and WWE gets used to him, they figure out a way to go with it. When I look at Keith Lee, I think he's a perfect fit for NXT. But as far as the main roster goes, he just screams SmackDown to me. Keith Lee. That's a big dude. He's a hoss. To be able to to be able to move like that and to be that powerful is ridiculous. It's really ridiculous. 
330. And the dude he went against, I looked at him, I'm like, he looked dude like Brock, was not he looked like Brock Lesnar, if I'm being completely honest. I'm like, if they if they looking for the Nether Brock Lesnar, I think they already got him. It depends on how they make him and book him. Yeah. And then next week, Johnny Wrestling is actually killed a wrestler after most people probably thought you might be out for some time. Hmm. After that last man standing match at TakeOver Brooklyn. It was rough. But he's clear and very teen dream are going to go at it. Like, I here's the thing. Velveteen Dream is going to be something so special. If Velveteen Dream gets called up, I'm calling it now. He can be everything that Gold Dust wasn't, but Velveteen Dream isn't going to need a champion. Velveteen Dream is literally going to be, he's, he's going to get an Intercontinental Championship reign at some point. Because I don't think Velveteen Dream is a tag wrestler. I don't think Velveteen Dream is the person that you stick with somebody just to have him do something. Velveteen Dream's going to take his lump. Velveteen Dream's going to lose. But here's the thing with Velveteen Dream. When I think of his comparisons, he's going to be like Gold Dust because I don't think they're going to view him as a world championship character. But at the same time, he's going to be like Bray Wyatt in the sense that when you look at Bray Wyatt, he just won his first championships in 2017. Bray Wyatt just started winning championships. Like, it took him forever, and he only has three championship wins. They were all fairly short. But Bray Wyatt is still Bray Wyatt. All Bray Wyatt needs is one good month of push, and Bray Wyatt is instantly a believable main eventer. That's Dream. Dream's going to get the Intercontinental Championship, and he's going to defend it against people like Seth Rollins. He's going to defend it against people like Drew McIntyre. He's going to defend it against people like Apollo Crews. And when he defends the Intercontinental Championship against those people, he's gold. He's literally going to be one of those people where it's like, wow, I didn't even notice that Velveteen Dream doesn't have a belt. Velveteen Dream is the Finn Balor. Velveteen Dream is the Jeff Hardy or Randy Orton. It's like his champ, his feuds are never for a belt, but man, he's good. He's 22 years old. I think he went against, he's going against EC3, Cassius Ono, Ricochet, and he was in the six-man ladder match. Everybody he's gone against has been in the business for over a decade. He's going against people that have decades over him and having great matches. Oh, and Aleister Black, who's only been around since like 2003. And the investigation has finally begun. mm -hmm, mm Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And William Regal has said enough. he's, He's trying to figure it out. So, you know, that's that. We'll see. Hopefully there's some developments. You know, EC3, he, um, you know... He thinks it might be Laurel Sullivan. Well, that will remain to be seen. Yeah, he really Laura thinks Sullivan that now. After what happened to him. Yeah, you know, but, you know, Laurel Sullivan, the way he was showing off in that match against Raul Mendoza, I wouldn't be surprised if it was him. But, um... But I don't think it was him. If I had to guess, it's somebody he, Ellison Black, had a feud with. It, oh, it's interesting, man, you know. Did Ellison Black ever had a tag team partner? No. Besides, you know, those little specialty main events. Like, he's never had a tag partner like that. It's not like a DIY situation. I'm thinking if somebody he had a rivalry with, he probably beat them. Never heard from him again until that attack happened. That's what I'm thinking. Well, you know, he, he had a pretty good undefeated streak. So, you know, you might be right. You could be right. But, um, all right. Now, if I must, Usually, if I must backtrack real quick. It was great to see Trish Stratus. Yes, yes, yes. She is she is aging like a fine wine. I was satisfied. That's why oh, I dear. really ain't have much to say about Monday Night Raw. They brought Trish Stratus back. That was that did it for me. Yeah, you're you're a hard man to please, Darno. But All no right. Trish Stratus. I still don't think Alexa Bliss deserved that match with Trish at Evolution. They could have gave that to Sasha Banks. Yeah, I'm with you. Alex has gotten so many opportunities and so many runs. I don't want to see Nikki Bella go against Ronda Rousey at a pay-per-view like that. I get you want to sell tickets, but how is the match going to be? Nikki Bella was never known to be the best wrestler. Is she really going to be able to carry Ronda Rousey through a match? Like, is that match going to be good? And not get her arm broken? <clears throat> exactly. Like, dude, like, Nikki Bella, if, if you, if you're, 
if you're seriously going to tell me or tweet me or text me or whatever that Nikki Bella is one of the best overall wrestlers on the women's roster, I ain't even going to reply. I can't even give your opinion the time of day because what have you been watching? In her prime, it was the Divas era. The Bella Twins era was the Divas era. And if you think that that was some of the best in re- dude, I'm sorry. Mm-hmm. Caitlyn, and as you can see, because she's in the Mae Young Classic, Caitlyn and AJ Lee were two of the best wrestlers wrestlers in that era. I, I hope they find a way to bring AJ Lee to Evolution. I really do. It'll depend, because you know who her husband is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's why I say I hope it works out. And she makes an appearance. She don't even better wrestling. Why does he show up? Dude, the, the way that the way that CM Punk has been acting, the way that he did Colt Cabana after their court case, she shows up the evolution. He might file for a divorce, dude. You never know. So I wouldn't hold your breath on that one. I'm just saying. To be honest, hey, we're we gonna we're gonna have a first ever all women's pay per view. Oh, I'm with you, like, dude. I mean, you know, you can have Caitlyn because you know the May Young Classic. You gotta think the finals of the May Young Classic are going to be there, so you could potentially have Caitlyn and some like super mega indie star be in the finals. AJ Lee, Trish Stratus. I mean, Sasha Banks and Bailey are going to be on the card. We're like, we know they're going to be on the card no matter what. So, you know, I mean, it's, it's going to be loaded. If you're a fan of Shimmer, if you're a fan of um, Shine in Japan, like, I mean, come on, man. If you're a fan of women's wrestling and you like women's wrestling, I'm not going to lie, dude. Like, WWE, the in-ring style might not appeal to everybody, but, I mean, it's the women's division. We're already seeing the golden age of WWE's women's division. This is the best the women's division has ever been. And some people will say, well, you know, Dallas back in the... No, 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 no. Fabulous Moolah had the championship for like a damn decade. That, that, ain't, that ain't what you're looking for, Hoss. Diversity, shop, storylines, character development, a whole pay-per-view after them. Uh, you know, come on, man. This is... Me and I, I think me and you both agreed on now. We have no complaints. We are super excited for the May Young Classic and um Evolution. We we don't none of the we our hands are off on that because we know that no matter what happens with Charlotte and Becky Lynch, that just means that the story is going to be told at the best way possible. If Charlotte's the baby face and Becky Lynch is the heel, or if Becky Lynch is the, the baby face and then Charlotte slowly turns heel, that just means the story is going to be even better because that means that Becky Lynch is going to be unshackled and Charlotte's going to be unshackled. I ain't gonna play with that. Does it really matter who's here, who the baby face is? That's the fact that them two are going at each other. Yeah, I mean, dude, like that's gonna be a submission. If people ever thought that you couldn't have an exciting match with two women wrestling a technical style, I can't wait till Evolution. I know there's gonna be a match at Hell in the Cell, but dude, that match at Evolution is gonna be nuts. That's probably gonna be the best wrestling match of WWE's year. Now, if I may, like, they're not gonna be hey, on spots. if I may, I want to make a plea to CM Punk. Yeah, okay. I know you had this this heated rivalry, this heated anger at WWE, but you're married to a woman who helped pay the way for WWE Evolution to happen. Let her get the recognition that she deserves just for one night, please. I'm serious. Even if they just show the camera on her. And everybody just claps for her for like 10 minutes. For AJ Lee to not have any part of this pay-per-view, and this pay-per-view was, dude, this pay-per-view was like 70%, 75% because of her. It was her run as Divas Champion that finally pushed the envelope. Because she, because when she was Divas Champion, then she dropped the page. And then after she dropped the page, that's when the whole ball started rolling for the women's revolution. Like, dude, like AJ Lee literally is the focal point in wrestling history for women's wrestling getting that big rub. Because let's be honest, promoters in the indies aren't going to do something unless WWE is doing it. Because WWE doing it means it can make money. So, I mean, AJ Lee, she... Historians are going to recognize her as probably the Hulk Hogan of women's wrestling. They're going to recognize her as being like one of the biggest focal points in the wrestling business as far as getting women's wrestling over. She needs to be there, man. Even if she doesn't wrestle, she needs to be there. Just just, just to show her on the camera and let people clap for her. The, but so, so me and you, I mean, that's, that's just how we feel about it. We feel that, you know, in some kind of capacity, even if she's just backstage. And, you know, the dirt sheets say AJ Lee was backstage. She just gets, you know, hug and maybe the, lo- the locker room can clap for her. She doesn't even have to be on camera. Whatever. No, she has to be on camera. True. 
the oh. WWE universe and people outside want to acknowledge AJ Lee for what she's done for women wrestling. Yeah. I just I'm just I'm just trying to be as realistic and as hopeful at the same time as possible. I just want her to be there. And then my question is, who does Kyrie Sane defend the title against? Yeah, man, you know, Shayna Baszler. Me and you have been waiting, dude. Uh she lost the championship two weeks ago and there hasn't been any entrance music, surprise entrance music on Raw. So I'm guessing that, you know, Shayna's gonna stick around to at least get her a rematch. So I guess they'll start building up that feud. The champ will be in the house tomorrow. I mean, next week she'll be there. The champ's gonna be there. You know, and that's and that's the great thing about having an hour long TV show. I know it's kind of like the other extreme, but it's like it, it it makes you wait and see. It's easier on the wrestlers. It's more exciting for the fans because as soon as something good happens, you're like, wait, it's over already. It's like you know, it's. And NXT, NXT treat you like Dragon Ball treats you. The good but, part hey, is gonna happen, and then you gotta wait till the next week. It's like, no, and we came back every week. We came back every week. It's like you you wanted more, and you mad. You gonna wait the week? I mean, regardless, but you're mad for that moment. You're like, no, I wanted more. It's not. Then what makes it even better? What makes it even better is NXT is on the network. So you can literally like binge and like you know go back and like it's it's like NXT like Raw and SmackDown you have to have Hulu or something like that to do that. The network is all in house. It's like you know, it's hey man, it's cool because you know NXT has been around for so long as a promotion now. You could actually go back and see some of the main players on the main roster right now when they were in NXT. And by the time you get through that era of NXT shows here. But, you know, it's just, it's cool, man, because, you know, Dragon Ball, me and you remember, because streaming services weren't always around. You either had to pay the $50 for the DVD, or you had to just hope that they would show the episodes in order. Because Toonami would show you an episode from, like, three sagas back. So, but, uh, all right, so, you got any closing remarks, Darnell? Well, if you if you listen to the yesterday episode... You already know, college football is here. Next season has begun. Next week, the NFL kicks off. We had fun yesterday. I'm pretty sure we're going to have fun next week. Get ready for the NFL oh, season. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And, and we get results from the first week of college. Oh, man. Oof. So stay tuned for that. Well, ladies and gentlemen, as has become tradition every week, I have some long-ass monologue and soliloquy about the wrestling business and the industry. And there's something I either try to direct your attention to or try to bring awareness to you directly. This week will be no different. I see on Twitter, I see on social media, I see a lot of immediate and direct feedback that shows that at least the American audience isn't feeling what WWE is putting out. I think from the wrestling end, a lot of wrestling fans are looking at other promotions And they see that other promotions are putting the in-ring content first. Yes, there are champions with long reigns. Yes, everybody who you want to win doesn't always get the world title. Yes, there are people who are underdogs in promotions that have no business even being put in the same sentence as WWE. But guys, you got to realize something. WWE has made itself into a multi-billion dollar multimedia company. WWE, since really they went public, really since Vince McMahon was in Congress during the testimony, has been slowly transitioning from being a professional wrestling promotion to a multimedia company. If you think that your tweets and your Facebook posts about being tired and not wanting to watch and this is stupid and what are you doing... Are really going to do anything. If you think that you not watching is really going to do anything, I have bad news for you. If you're in the financial metrics, cool. If you're not, I'm going to make it like really simple. I'm not going to mention any numbers. WWE just had their best fiscal quarter in history. They had their best fiscal quarter in history. They're having their highest performance on the New York Stock Exchange, and they acknowledge that they have deficiencies business-wise. They acknowledge that live event attendance is down. 
they acknowledge that they're not retaining a lot of subscribers for the network. And they acknowledge that, you know, it's kind of costly touring all the time. Dallas, what does all that mean? It means that on one hand, WWE is trying to expand their female audience a lot. They're really, really trying to bring up their numbers. According to the WWE website, 40% of their viewers are female. That was before the women's evolution. So, if you're a WWE fan, if you're not interested in all that quote-unquote indie stuff, women's wrestling on WWE is about to get a lot better because they want to make sure that that in-ring product can attract women. They want to make sure women see themselves in prominent positions. They want to make sure that women, well, you know, they have a pay-per-view just like the guys do. They're just as good as the guys. And that's exactly what they should be doing. They should have been doing it before all this social media stuff. They should have been doing it before the Me Too movement. They should have been doing it. It shouldn't have taken all these things for the professional wrestling business to realize that there have been some great women's wrestlers that should have got all the spotlight in the world. So you should be encouraged about that. Also, in a conference call, they were asked if the UK division will ever become the European division. They said, not yet, basically a wait and see. Yesterday, it was announced that WWE is holding its first ever talent tryout in Germany. So, WWE is going to be holding shows in China, or they already held the shows in China. They had tryouts in China. Now they're starting to get into the Chinese market. Now, they're holding trials in Germany. So they basically have all of the United Kingdom on lock. Now they're trying to get German talent. For those who don't know about Germany, Germany has WXW, which is like one of the bigger engine promotions worldwide, but WXW is based at Germany. So there's a lot of talent they might get. If I remember Alexander Wolf, he's German. You know, so uh, Alexander Black, he's from the Netherlands, and he was in WXW a lot. So with the UK division, NXT UK, you have a lot of stuff there to be excited about. Because they're a publicly traded company and business analysts and stakeholders want to see them improve the women's division and want to see them work on their global reach and improving the UK division to include all of Europe. Dallas, what is this whole monologue about? Guys, there's good news and there's bad news. The good news is WWE is doing some good business. The bad news is WWE is doing some good business. Nothing about the main roster is going to change. Why would you change something that just netted you $2 billion? I wouldn't. If you're on Twitter every week and you're only complaining about two shows out of like seven that they offer, if you don't watch NXT, if you ain't going to watch the Mae Young Classic, if you don't watch 205 Live, if you're not going to watch NXT UK, then I'm sorry, but you're complaining for nothing. I think me and Darnell said it last week. WWE is giving us everything that we want is just not on the main roster. So the topic of the soliloquy is this. WWE is not ever going to go back to the Attitude Era. Instead of doing a Facebook post or a Twitter post about back when wrestling was great, either support somebody else or get the network. If you get the network, You don't have to pay your cable bill anymore to watch Raw SmackDown. You can watch all the good stuff for $10. If you support somebody else like New Japan or Ring of Honor, you'll get all the pro wrestling, not sports entertainment, you'll get all the pro wrestling that you want because these are privately owned companies who know that their fans want pro wrestling, not sports entertainment, pro wrestling. So marinate on that. The network has everything from WWE that you want. I don't see why nobody's paying cable these days anyway, Darnell, but I mean, that's the fact of the matter. Raw and SmackDown, those are the money getters. Those are the day jobs. NXT, NXT UK, May Young Classic, 205 Live, that's the good stuff. And on that note, I'm through. I guess we'll see you guys next week. Bye, Darnell. Adios. The podcast you just heard was made using Anchor. Ever thought about making your own podcast? Anchor makes it really easy for anyone to get started. It's a one-stop shop for recording, hosting, and distributing podcasts. Best of all, it's 100% free. Sign up now at anchor.fm slash new. That's anchor.fm slash new to get started.